Talk to me about storytelling. Why is storytelling a, an important uh, avenue for expression and self-development? Okay. One of the things that fascinates me is the way in which linguistics governs our life. Even if you don't see your primary form of expression being words, and there are obviously people out there who are graphically orientated, there are people who perhaps express themselves most through movement. I think it's nigh on universal that language, spoken, written language, defines our sense of shape, perhaps more than anything else. So by the time we're maybe even six or seven years old, certain phrases, repeated expressions, labels, become imprinted, almost hardwired, in our sense of self. So a classic would be the way in which parents label their kids. They so maybe if you have two or three kids, you know, one is the wild, one 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 is always uh, selfish, or one's very noisy, one's extrovert. These labels become bandied about with great, uh, with certainly a great risk. So as a child, the next thing you know, you've heard yourself being described as uh, quiet or wild, whatever, and then that you you've developed a narrative, and your story in your head is. I'm the quiet one. Or you rebel against it. I'm not the fucking quiet one. I'm the, uh, they say I'm the quiet one. I'm the, well, you're reacting again to the narrative. It's not like the narrative exists alongside you and that you can look at it in, the, in a sort of calm way. It impinges upon your sense of self. You're banging up against it. So what I'm interested in is how one can potentially reclaim that game so that you're not the victim of a story that has been imposed upon you but you're the author of it and that's a bloody difficult thing to do in practice uh, not least because an understanding an objective understanding of how these linguistic patterns impinge upon you is rare even amongst i would say very well educated creative people, it is relatively rare that they have the objectivity to understand the degree to which language has straight jacket, jacketed their sense of self. So a lot of the work that I do, but particularly um, long weekends like the one that's coming up, is about understanding the mechanics in some detail of why language and, in a broader sense, story, narrative, is so important in the way that we shape our own lives or the way in which we perpetuate narratives that have been fed to us by other people that are invariably negative or one feels are negative. And it isn't just simple. It isn't just a simple thing of someone has called me X and, and that's a lie. Or, because if you think about the people that we know intimately in our lives, our immediate family, um, spouses, lovers, close friends, which probably in total number, uh, not many, perhaps more than 30 or 40 people, but if you look at those people and you look at how many of them seem incapable, even in late middle age, to extricate themselves from the ghosts of their past, it seems to me um, prevalent that, they're, that, that we almost as a species, could do with a bit of help in terms of self-understanding self so that we can benefit from a life that is defined by ourselves rather than other people. So there are two or three really, really big aspects to what I consider the rationale of this process. One of them is story structure, which is a bizarre thing, because if you have read a bit of Jung, 
and he's he wasn't making it up he he got it from people from thousands of year bef years before him but the idea of a sort of collect what he called a collective unconscious we could put that in a different way and that is that the same stories have been told for thousands of years and those stories whether it was by homer or, or plautus these these very very early uh, recorded storytellers um they had mythic qualities they had simple plots sometimes they were not so simple but generally relatively simple plots and character development that illustrated very very old life shapes um, often it might be a movement from selfishness to selflessness that's one of the oldest stories ever told and it keeps getting told uh, at other times it may be uh, uh, overreaching ambition and the cost of that and so on if you look at those stories what I think we can probably all agree on is that even if we it's not in our psyche even if it's not implicit in at the moment of our birth by the time we've got to again seven or eight years old we have already had uh, absorbed within our mind almost by osmosis a sense of common shape uh, in other words, the, a universal aspect or aspect, universally experienced aspects of the human condition. And I would argue that we get that very, very young. We forget that. I think what often happens is we forget that. And what through trauma, when we have a traumatic experience, which the vast majority of the time is not something melodramatic, such as a car crash or um, a tsunami, it's actually... <laughs> at the hearth of our home it's a domestic crisis visited upon us invariably by a parent uh, a significant other a sibling when that occurs the defense mechanisms that kick in in order to protect ourselves from further trauma seem to shut down our ability to understand the commonality of of trauma in people's lives so stories have this wonderful ability if you can be truly open to them if it's almost like a almost a sixth sense if all of your the fibers of your intuition are open to the wisdom of, of story one of the strongest aspects of subtext is do you know what your brothers and sisters across this entire planet are going through the same shit and when you understand that if you like in an emotional way i believe that to be remarkably nurturing when one feels disassociated from the common experience of trauma in those that are around us we tend to worry about it doubly we get utterly fixated on the individuality of our experience and that compounds the trauma we're alone so stories have this when they work well and it's a bizarre thing because I think it's almost like we have to be taught to understand story in order for the stories to have their full potential effect when that when that occurs I, I truly think that's a wonderful thing so the what I'm trying to do in, in all of the work that I'm involved in but uh, particularly on some of these uh, inspiration workshops which are about um, opening up an understanding of self, understanding of one's own story. What I'm trying to do, as I say, is uh, shine a strong light on some of those tricks that are inherent in the story process. So I've touched on the sort of universality of story, if you like, myth. Within that, there are two other things that are, if you like, are the portals, if one wants to go slightly sci-fi on it, to what I would say is a greater understanding of this magical thing. One is to do with what we might call rites of passage. And this is a, a subject that someone like Joseph Campbell, if you're listening to this, you should check out who he is. Go and check him out on YouTube. He was a great scholar of mythology, but one of his great theses, and I would sign up to it, is that perhaps one of the reasons that we are drawn so much to story, because we take that completely for granted, and I'm not sure if we should, why the hell are we so utterly obsessed with story? Why, why do we tell stories? Why do we listen to them? Why do we laugh at them? Why do we cry at them? What, what's going on there? His thesis was, could it be that when we have unsuccessfully transitioned from one aspect of our life, one chapter of our life to another, we need to go back, if you like, in our head to compensate for the failure of ritual? 
So if we can think of a specific example, and he uses this quite often, um, that classic thing of girl to woman, boy to man, that may occur at around about puberty, which was ritualized in m many um, cultural traditions for hundreds, if not thousands of years, has become very diluted. So if, you're, if you live in a developed country now, and you're 14, and uh, your balls drop as a boy, and you, you start to grow a bit of hair, you're lucky if your dad says, let's go down to the pub for half a pint of lager. That's the rite of passage. Whereas if we went back, and it, it still exists perhaps in some uh, places on the planet still, just about, but if you look at, say, Papua New Guinea or the South Pacific Islands, for hundreds and hundreds of years, they would have a ritual that might be something like this, where a 14-year-old boy would be confronted by the older men in his village, his dad, his uncle, his older siblings, and they would start to fight him. They'd put on masks, the older guys would put on masks, and they'd start to beat the shit out of this boy. Then, and it's a proper fight, it's, it's, there's blood, this is not just like mucking about, this is a proper punch-up. Then, they let him win. They let him win, and at the moment that they, he has given the, them a good whooping, they take one of the masks that they're wearing, and they put it on his face. And these masks represent the gods. They represent the sort of devils or the demons and the and sometimes the benevolent deities of their culture. So what they do in that ritual is they take a boy, 13, 14 year old boy, and they make him a god. But they act it out. They perform it out. I mean they this fight is very, very important. The visceral aspect of that experience, if you like once again the muscle memory we talked about that on a separate podcast, the muscle memory that that child will carry for the rest of his life allows a simplicity of understanding. The ache that he has in his shoulder because his dad just absolutely clobbered him it is a visceral reminder of the experience that he's just going through. And when that mask goes on his face, he knows for sure that something has changed. So I guess the sense what you're saying is uh, coming to a uh, an understanding of the transition in a narrative form. In this sense, it's a symbolic putting the mask on someone and they've transitioned into a man or, or a god or a deity. Yeah. But storytelling helps to helps the individual to put a shorthand on the experience that they've just gone through to understand exactly how it sits in their psyche. I think so. And I think, you know, we, at the beginning I was just talking about the power of linguistics. And what I've just described there is a non-verbal experience. Mm -hmm. uh, the great thing about screen stories, uh, which is where I work most of the time, and the reason why perhaps the screen stories uh, are the, the most popular uh, um, of stories around, it's the most popular medium that is around today, is that it, there is a tremendous ease of understanding in terms of the viewers engagement with an authorial agenda that it transcends language it actually helps it it is it fixes on a, a, a subconscious understanding of the shape of life it with greater ease than words on paper so so far we talked about a sort of universality of experience and being able to if you like re-engage with the commonality of trauma in people's lives and the, the tremendous um, comfort that that can bring to us, the sort of mental health that that can bring us. We've talked about the specific role of rites of passage in our life and how failed rites of passage need to be compensated for. And the third thing, which I've already just mentioned a little bit, is this business of our subconscious mind and an understanding that um, we now know scientifically that our conscious brain is a little floppy sliver of the totality of, of this great organ that we have in our head. And there's a huge chunk which is working uh, at an unbelievable rate, 24-7, that is unconscious to us. Stories are all about that. Stories are external representations of interior shape. A plot, a character development, is an exterior representation of an interior shape, if you like an interior psychology. And what we're doing it with stories is giving furniture to things that are, are often quite ephemeral. So it makes solid for us things that are 
tucked away in dark corners of our own subconscious that we are failing to deal with. If you then take those principles and apply to that a process of, not exactly work, I'll call it play really, where you begin to write out, and sometimes it is to do with putting pen to paper, a sense of your own narrative. I, I believe that this can be uh, profoundly cathartic, that it can allow any one of us to uh, become re-enfranchised, where you take back the power of narrative. It's actually to do with the joy, uh, and, and it can be instantaneous, where you realize that what you have done for many years is run with a baton that was passed to you. Someone gave you a narrative. You accepted it you voluntarily. You took it into your own hands and you continue to run with it. You don't have to. It's a choice. Ultimately, it's a choice. To get to the place where you make that choice is the work that I do. It's trying to give people an environment to create a series of of insights, if you like, or opportunities for insight that can allow any person to see the baton that they've got in their hand and to bung it away. And the incredible liberation that you can feel almost instantly, and sometimes it involves little bits of touchy-feely ritual that I get people to do, uh, but it allows you to viscerally engage that, bung this thing away, um, so that you can ostensibly raise your eyes look around you and see an, a totally different world. It's not a world that has been, that you're seeing through the prism that was presented to you, probably when you were quite young. You could just push that to one side. It does not mean that you are seeking to blame significant others in your life. It's not to do with blame. It is not to do with retribution at all. No, that just doesn't even enter into it. It is literally perceiving that you have created a world, every aspect of your world, through the prism of your own trauma and defense mechanisms to that trauma. Recreating your own narrative. Recreating your own narrative. And that's where the trick starts. So there's a, 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 the, another thing that I've, another great piece of work that I've pinched completely is from um, a guy called James Pennybaker, who's still alive. And if you do stumble into this, James, I'm very grateful to you. So he works at the University of Texas and he, in the 70s, um, started to do some research into what he then began to call expressive writing. And you should make sure, if you listen to this, that you are able to distinguish between what he was doing and a lot of other work which is similar but, but has distinctly different impacts, such as automatic writing or semi-automatic writing. These are very, very different things. Expressive writing is quite specific. And the work that he did was with initially undergraduates on his campus. And he invited them to uh, sit on their own in a room with a pad and a pen and a pen or a pencil and work uh, continuously writing for 20 minutes. Don't worry about grammar. Don't worry about spelling. Write about something that's been traumatic or painful in your life for 20 minutes and just don't let that pen leave the paper. If you run out of things to say, just repeat the sentence that's, that came before. So it really was continuous. And then, very, very importantly, don't show it to anybody. This is not writing for anybody else other than yourself. Don't ever ever show it to anybody. Then what he did was get those people to do it again three more times, three subsequent days. If they did it on Monday, they did exactly the same thing on Tuesday, same thing on Wednesday, same thing on Thursday. And what he did was um, a follow-up trial and study, and it turned into many thousands of people eventually. And he compared that with a model of people who'd been through traumatic experiences and gone down a traditional road of therapy and counseling. And it's a, it's a compelling study because what you will find measured through a number of different ways, self-assessment, visits to the doctors, the use of prescriptive drugs, a whole bunch of different things, days off work, that the group who had done this expressive writing experience, by most measures, were in pretty darn good shape compared to those that had gone down the traditional route of therapy. So I'm fascinated in this. And what I've done is to co-opt that, all that work into this other work that I've done, which is to do with three-act structure and understanding 
are the benefits of um, wonderful storytelling from the past. And it could be a, a relatively recent movie that is just crackingly good, or it could be a great novel from the, the 19th century. It doesn't really matter. We have this wonderful, uh, this wealth of great storytelling that, that uh, here we are in the 21st century, that we have immediate access to. And if one can understand, as I said earlier, the skill and craft of those stories, if you understand the mechanics of it, you actually have what a uh, number of people, I think Joseph Campbell included, have called helping hands. This idea that there are a lot of, we, we often, when we're feeling low, we often feel utterly isolated. And I think at its most extreme, suicidal thoughts creep in when we feel there is no hope, when, there, when we feel so uniquely betrayed and neglected, abandoned and deserted, not least by our own psyche, that there is there is nothing left for us to live for. The wonderful thing, I think, and maybe this is overstating it, I don't know, but I do think that stories scream out that that is wrong. That is an incorrect perception of the nature of what it is to be a funny little homo sapiens on this planet. There are a lot of helping hands. I don't just mean other people, there are other things. But if you can open your brain, and it may just be almost a trick of, of, of language or a, a trick with one's own psyche. But if you can open yourself up to that notion, I think it is unbelievably supportive. Just to help you understand the some of the interior logic of how I am using those exercises in conjunction with a, an understanding of the rhythm of what we might call, I suppose, three-act story. And that is and I can describe it quite simply in terms of use of pronouns. When we, we write journals or we, when we talk to ourselves and we think back on traumas of our life, I is absolutely at the center of that experience. It's I, me, my. Everything is I, me, my. And before you know it, actually, we become, uh, we drown in our, our sense of individual self. It's suffocating it compounds pain very easily if you're not careful. <clears throat> the wonderful thing about story is you can travel quite swiftly from I, me, my to she, he, it, or we, and occasionally to you. So as you begin to look objectively at your experience and the, the commonality of that trauma with people around you, it's almost impossible for it to stay as I, me, my. It becomes we. Or if you start to fictionalize your own work, and that's some of the things that I get people to do, or you use the source of your trauma as a foundation for, for fictional work, it's another way of doing it, you quickly make yourself into a she, a he, and it. You, you, you take that experience and you externalize it. You push it outside of yourself. Well, what is that? You're now an author. You're now the author of your experience. So it's a very, very simple trick. You know, even if it's taking one, a car crash that you experienced, or the death of a, the painful death of a parent or a loved one, the infidelity of a spouse. If you go from I, me, my to she, he, it, before you know it, it's actually a story. It's actually outside of yourself. It's not, it's not implicitly you. It's not the marrow of your bone. It's not your limbs. It's an experience that has been now shaped by your perspective of it, and that is very, very empowering. It's very healing, wonderfully healing. And you know what? It's actually, dare I say it, enjoyable. It's something where we very tentative about using that word, but it's actually quite fun. And uh, you can't help but smile quite quickly, even at the most god-awful experiences. When you start to, to shift it from I, me, my, to she, he, it, or to we, it, you get a tremendous rush of power, but I, I think you what the, the biggest thing that happens is, is, as I said earlier, is you raise your eyes. When you're thinking, I, me, my, you're just, you basically, everything's inwardly looking. Your eyes are sort of swiveled on their own route, staring into the darkness of your own soul or lack of soul. Mm -hmm. When you start writing authorially, your eyes come swiveling out and you look out. You look wide. The horizon becomes much bigger. You're looking at people around you dare I say it, with love, and because what does that word mean? It means empathy, really. It means an understanding that this person is a version of me. They're very, very similar to me. Oh, my God, they're me. Mm. That is an authorial process. So um, that it's a trick, 
but it's extraordinary how rapid one can move from a position of desolation and pessimism to one of creativity. In fact, they're utterly linked. Uh, I remember reading some silly little thing about the word uh, victim. You know, we the victim psychology, which is something that, if we're not careful, we all have to be wary of, um, can very easily, with a little sort of crossing out and changing of letters be turned into a victor experience and it's if you think about trauma as an opportunity for growth or trauma as an opportunity for understanding other people better this is really what this work is is about it's not that makes it sound very touchy feely it doesn't have to be earnest at all it's just a, almost a wry experience w r y experience where you're looking at your own obsessive concern with your own past experience and then realize quite quickly how maybe you overcooked it because you suddenly realize that everybody around you has problems that are just as big and sometimes seem infinitely more serious than your own so it's a, it, it takes an enormous amount of weight off you um, it's his magic. I, I, I think it's a, a wonderfully in the best and broadest sense spiritual experience that is not unusual it's not to do with joining an organized religion. It's actually to do with watching movies differently or reading books differently or, dare I say it, writing your own. So the work that I'm doing is, is around that. And it's, as I say, it's quite difficult to be distill it completely. I think the thing I would say is, come, if you've got an opportunity, uh, do check out what we've got online. And if you are in the locality, do think about coming to these workshops. Because if you think of... Uh, we've been chatting for whatever, 25 minutes or something. But if you were doing eight hours a day, this is what, literally what we're doing, eight hours a day for three days in a row, that's 24 hours of of work. It's not me going blah, blah, blah. It's actually getting you to, to do some writing, working in groups. That's a whole lot of tricks that we employ. And it is a very physical experience that through 24 hours of engaging with this stuff, you, have tr you can travel a very long way. And it's fun.